that on? Yep. Okay, thanks everyone, hi. Uh, yeah, so I write for Programmable Web, uh, which you can check out online. Uh, and also, I, in my previous background, I was working as an urban planner and public health researcher. So it's really great to then be coming back to those sorts of themes, but looking more from the civic tech and the, um, and the API side. So we're all pretty excited about the um, potential of civic tech to solve city challenges today. Cities are becoming... Does we go... No, that one's not working. Oh, I'll just use this. Um, so cities are becoming an, an important platform on which tech solutions are being created. On the left, you can see here Uber, Airbnb, and Yelp. And they're all uh, private companies, but they're using the city as their platform. So Uber connects drivers and passengers, and then they're traveling through the city. Um, Airbnb is about creating transactional value between homeowners or renters and travelers. And then uh, Yelp is providing um, a, is using the city as a platform to connect local businesses and restaurants with customers. And then also you see a growing number of civic tech uh, startups, which um, uh, Chris mentioned earlier, is there's about 100 uh, that are even just building off the, uh, building civic tech solutions just off the Socrata open data uh, supply that's been generated. And so these civic tech startups are working to resolve cities, uh, resolve problems in one specific city and then looking at how to scale that so that they can be uh, solving cities at an even global sort of scale. So we do live in, uh, so city authorities around the world are recognising that this pace of change is happening and they're starting to think about then how to use mobile apps and cloud-based services effectively in how they run cities. It's what um, uh, a policy wonk, Mike Bracken from the UK, says that uh, digital transformation is pervading every uh, industry, including city governments, because of internet. So when you, when you look at this, um, the idea of smart cities is that the promise of tech, uh, so the promise is that tech can help us create an automated responsive data architecture that reimagines city governments as a platform. It's a bit like what Manfred was talking about earlier, where if governments can reimagine the city as the platform, that then outside developers can create niche and new services that the city government themselves hadn't even imagined on that. Uh, Okay, so, uh, but when you take that to, oh, that's right, this doesn't work. So, but when you take that to its natural conclusion, you end up with this sort of acid rained on uh, dystopian future city of Blade, Run Blade Runner. So, and if you don't really believe me, then, that, uh, then you should because it's already happened at least once. So yesterday we heard from Mike Amundsen who talked about, uh, he mentioned in passing, the Swiss architect, urban planner, and a Parisian resident for a while, Le, Le Corbusier. Corbusier had, had pretty noble visions. His idea was that through scientific rationalism, efficiency and social improvement through design, you could actually create livable cities that use the best of tech to uh, provide an environment. So he was saying things like democracy and equality through the, uh, the built environment and good or enlightened buildings will elicit similar attitudes or behaviours as the buildings that they're created. But then this is the result of that thinking, was we got the urban housing projects that were quite popular, not only across America, but in um, Australia and other, like, and throughout, the, uh, th out throughout Europe as well. Here on the left, at the bottom, you can actually see Le Corbusier's plan where he wanted to actually destroy a couple of the arrondissements in Paris and build this um, urban blight there as well. So th uh, the idea was that this is sort of a bit like the smart cities uh, uh, noble ideas, is that, but this is where potentially we could end up. Uh, okay, and so then recently at the Barcelona City Expo, you, you saw some of this sort of thinking coming forward from different planners around the world. So Singapore, for example, talked about a model that was going to create the sort of modern Le Corbusier, and you saw others who were talking about how to connect tech with some of the policy drivers of local government. And then you had Boyd Cohen talking about 62 different indicators that all uh, help together to identify or measure how smart a city is. So I'll come back to the Boyd Cohen stuff in a bit. But as the international spy archer would say, if you want Blade Runner, because that's how you make Blade Runner. Um, okay, so then uh, instead, uh, here's a model that I wanted to suggest 
based off um, uh, Mehdi suggesting that we do something uh, that I'd be a bit controversial uh, and uh, suggest sort of a new model for how a, a smart city could be created. So um, first of all, we've heard from Sequada who talks about the importance of open data. I think one of the things with open data and what you see with smart cities moving into open data and then pr providing them by APIs is it's not a real, it's a, it's, it really is a bit of a mishmash around what sort of data gets uh, provided or opened up. But I think if you take a step back and you look at the, uh, the building blocks of a city, so if you start putting all of the open data around things like uh, parks, uh, the blocks of land that's owned by local government, um, uh, bus shelters where the locations are, all of the sort of physical assets and infrastructure of a city, I think you're going to actually then be able to provide the sort of enabling data sets that cities can actually build on. So in the US there's a civic tech startup called Trailhead Labs and what they've done is they've created, a, they've created or worked with cities to create data sets that looked at uh, the walking tracks in parks. So once they had those data sets and then were able to open them up, they were then able to go to outdoor um, uh, equipment suppliers, uh, uh, physical sports um, suppliers and all the rest and start designing with them commercial products built off the parks uh, trails data, for example. So, um, and I think one of the other areas that's really missing in this ba uh, basic building blocks is the decision-making structures. So you have Heather Savory, who's the head of the Open Data in the UK, and she said there's not actually any common data set that just describes all of the government agencies for the UK. So you can't get that in just one data set. You can't get all of the decision-making structures for a city, all of the committees or the planning um, the, even the planning calendar dates, you can't get all of that in the one um, data set, for example. So they're the sorts of basic building blocks that actually will enable things uh, to grow much faster than uh, some of the sort of um, open data that's just released ad hoc at the moment. So that's the first step, I think. I think the second then is, some, is a change to some of the procurement and investment decisions that are made being made by smart, uh, but being made by cities. The first is something that Socrata are, are offering, which is this sort of open platform, and it needs to be API enabled. I was speaking to SAP um, a few weeks ago, and even though they've got like a proprietary platform, when they're working with city governments, they're trying to make it open API enabled, so that anyone. So again, it's like what Manfred was talking about with this, uh, with. Uh, creating a platform in which you can envision new ideas that even the creators of the platform haven't thought of. So in that same way, a city that can move forward with its um, uh, smart city uh, agenda by having an open uh, platform API enabled, which then uh, uh, developers can actually build products and link it through to the, uh, the open data from the city government. I think also this is a bit of what Chris was talking about in his talk as well, where then some of that is public facing. So you can have elements of that that's not just open data, but in his case, he was talking about the open data being public facing, but then 30% of it also being internal facing and helping business internally be much more efficient. Uh, then we need to see a change in procurement policies. At the moment, uh, services like Socrata and there's a Parisian uh, a French-based one, uh, Open Data Soft as well, they sometimes when they're trying to talk to cities about using their open data platforms, the cities can't get their heads around it because the costs are just too low and they work on a subscription model, neither of which cities can... Re cities want to invest in a big project uh, like the Le Corbusier type models and be able to um, run with that. But instead, the, the nature of government is changing where it really needs to be able to fail fast and iterate quickly and learn from its mistakes, much like we see in the um, entrepreneur and the uh, API uh, business workspace. So procurement policies really need a massive uh, overhaul and it's, I don't know, it's a tricky one as far as I don't think that's really being discussed and I don't think it's something that uh, there's any community lobbying or awareness about. So it's difficult to make it even a, a, a political agenda at times. I think there's also this digital workforce that's needed within city governments. So often we see um, digital, uh, we see bureaucrats um, working in uh, city governments 
at home they're used to using Instagram and uh, Yelp and, uh, and Facebook and all of the rest. But in, as the minute they walk through the doors at work, they pull all of that down and then they're back to PDFs or uh, Word documents and all the rest. So there's sort of this uh, disconnect that's happening in cities as well and there's this need for driving um, digital, a uh, digital workforce. The two others that I think are really crucial and again aren't really, that have been a little bit experimented with, at least the incubators, the final one isn't being talked about at all. But the incubators um, idea, I think you're seeing a little bit of this, but what we really need is for incubators to be a city uh, resource in the same way that libraries or childcare centres are. So that every city is actually trying to build up a sort of a, a, a digital, um, uh, digital business landscape in their local areas. And then finally with that, we need to sort of facilitate civic hack hackers joining with community groups. You actually need, for this I think you need two things. First you need the civic hackers who are going to be um, recognised in the same way that the city recognises and then works alongside the urban renewal, uh, the neighbourhood renewal committees or the um, local business associations or whatever. So they, the cities need to seek out the civic hack hacking meetups and form a a, a, a relationship with those groups and then they need to sort of connect those groups with the rest of the existing community infrastructure and this is something I'm just really not seeing anywhere. So yesterday we heard Isabel Morney talking about for example the Barcelona APIs and how they're measuring air quality and then fr from that developers are making an app that can uh, suggest a, a run through the city that's going to be the least contaminated or the least um, uh, air polluted sort of uh, run through the city. So we're seeing some of those sorts of novel ideas being created, but there's no connection with all of the air quality projects. None of the developer communities are working with, say, an asthma foundation or with a community, uh, with a parents group that's, cons that's of kids with asthma or something like that, or even with a marathon running group that operates through the city, who are going to be the ones who are going to be the users who have need for that technology and who can give a really good insight. Like, so perhaps for the marathon runners, it's not just about running through the city in the least polluted place, but they want to avoid the uh, major train stations where a lot of people come out at peak times or something. Now, that might be something that you wouldn't make just based off the API, but if you're in contact with those marathon running groups, then you actually know that that's a, as much a concern for them as the air pollution. And with the Asthma Foundation and those sorts of air quality sensors, they're the ones who are going to be using the data or need to use it. Uh, there was a really great example in uh, both California and Australia of a group that's what they did, uh, it's called natural landscaping, and what they've done, sorry, natural computing, and what they've done is they've gone to um, the business association in two cities and they've talked to the business associations about how do they activate the retail centre and from that they've then identified a sensor infrastructure that they want to place and put in place to be able to measure when people come in, in and out of the actual retail hub. And then the business association have lobbied the city government to say we need this technology and this sensor environment so that we can be um, understanding what sort of business uh, needs we have in the local community. So, so there are some opportunities, I think, if civic tech go to the community agencies in that third sector first. And then finally, I think, uh, and this I guess maybe is a little bit that's also a bit controversial, is I think that if you solve one of these five challenges, you're going to solve, you're going to understand how to scale products and solve city challenges across the board. So multimodal transport, we see a bit of action around this as far as uh, cities like Helsinki are trying to uh, find ways to be able to uh, reduce traffic con congestion and use data to understand and better have flow of uh, the population. Uh, food sustainability, which uh, you see in things like Yelp, um, where they're actually adding the uh, food safety score, as um, uh, Chris Metcalf mentioned. So we're adding that into the restaurant reviews. But you can actually all heap around food sustainability as far as some areas that are, are food poor, where there isn't a local supply of fruit and vegetables. There's about 40% of our food system it just gets thrown to wastage because it's not sold efficiently. So if you can somehow activate that. So I notice in Paris, in the metros, there's sometimes um, like green grocers at the metro stops. So if you could somehow coordinate 
the food wastage that's been thrown out by supermarkets on the final day so that it's going to those distribution points at key um, train stations or public transport egress, then you might be able to reduce the, um, uh, the food wastage. And these are the sorts of things that, that as we move to a more dense city environment are going to become issues that we really, we've really got to use tech to solve. Um, alcohol harms in the nighttime economy is something that's actually, it's a global sort of problem, but it's not really talked about that much. It, uh, and I think, um, I think as more cities try to activate their evening economy as, um, as important as their day economy, then that's going to, that a lot of them, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries, fall into a trap where the only thing they provide at night is alcohol venues, and then they've got all these other sorts of risks that come with that. Um, urban heat island is the idea that our cities have been designed to absorb and hold heat. And so in Paris, a couple of years ago, you had people over the age of 80, there was sort of a real spike in the mortality rates amongst that population because, um, be, because they couldn't handle the heat, basically. And then you have micro-enterprise development, which I'm excited by things like Uber, for, uh, so Uber not so much, um, by Airbnb, who are actually allowing people it's giving a new income source. So for those in some cities where the ca people can't av afford their rent, then they've been able to use Airbnb for a couple of weekends a, 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 w a month, and then they're generating enough income to, to be able to uh, pay their rent and get by sort of thing. So some of those sorts of micro-enterprises, as well as more traditional micro-enterprise development, say for new arrivals from um, uh, refugee countries and getting people started in developing a small business. Again, that ties into maybe the, um, uh, the Parisian food distribution points. So we're, if you're working up micro-enterprise development, you're also addressing uh, inequality within uh, a city environment, which is at widening. So these, this, this is sort of my take on it, but it does mean that we're ending up, again, with the sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, policy-first framework, which I was saying at the start is what Le, Corb Le, Le Corbusier and other urban planners into a technocratic Blade Runner-esque future. So, but I think the difference here is the, this real thing around the facilitating the civic hackers and the community, group, community groups. That's the pivot point as I see it. So if you've actually got a really activated and engaged civic tech community that's speaking with and sharing those skills with the community sector, then you can actually turn that into a um, bottom-up approach as much as a top-to-bottom approach. And I think, so I think that, you know, like that's the um, way forward as far as the, as the way I see it. Um, okay, so then there's these 15 roles of uh, all city governments. The cities vary around the world, so um, police might be looked after at a state or a national level, or it might be a local community level, but because, it's a, because cities are an act, actual place and it's a platform in which these things are played out, then when, even when cities don't have the full responsibility for something, say, education, they've often got platform-type roles like uh, bus transportation, for, uh, school bus transportation, or um, bringing in parents to work in the, um, uh, the school canteens or what have you. So you've got, like, there is a sort of platform role. So even where you don't have direct policy driver, you do have a, um, uh, you do have a, a, a city influence or a facilitation role. So, and the thing, I'll, the, the reason why I chose those five urban challenges is because they go across the full length of the, um, uh, of those policy drivers. So if, so, and this is why I say, if you solve one of these five, then you'll be able to uh, replicate and find solutions for any sort of civic challenge. It's an idea that, um, a, a, again, SAP, when I was talking to them, they, they're using this. So they go in with cities, and instead of saying to a city, um, okay, uh, we've got this tech solution, this is what you need to do. Instead, they come in and say, tell us what your problems are in your local community and we'll orchestrate a tech solution that fits in with that. So I could actually, I was going to just say, call out one, you know, call out one of those five and I'll uh, map how this would work, but uh, we don't really have time. So we'll just choose um, urban uh, heat island effect. Maybe I should... Go back to my notes. Okay, so I think the process is you map the current processes and the data sets. 
Then you consider the predictive analytics. You consider where the opportunities for sensor and automating the infrastructure are, and then you build the dashboards around the particular issues. So for, for example, with the urban heat island effect, um, what you do then is you get a map of the city and you'd identify the temperature variation in that city. You overlay it with demographics of the ageing of the population and people with um, limited mobility, because they're going to be the ones at the highest risk um, during um, high temperatures. You, ca you have a look at previous year's temperature forecasts for the area. Uh, and then you can do things like start looking at things like the, the bigger libraries that have air conditioning and what public transport that you're in control of or um, aged care bus supplies or whatever, and can you actually run route uh, uh, rosters to be able to pick people up and take them to those sorts of cooling areas? What's your capacity for introducing green roofs or for white walls um, to reflect the heat? And can you, yeah, can you re re reroute the public transport to civic centres? So that's sort of with an urban heat island type approach where you'd be actually using a combination of open data, the building blocks of the cities, and then actually trying to work out the solutions and using some predictive analytics around which solution is going to be the most uh, affordable and most effective and most equitable. So, uh, this is, uh, so, so what you do is you end up, instead of getting this sort of uh, dashboard, which I'm not a fan of at all, so this is for London, and it's got a sort of a, a number of, uh, data points. I don't really know how you'd use that. I mean, it looks really great. You know, uh, they're pretty and I can, you know, I can be fascinated from an infographics point of view, but it doesn't really tell you anything about what to do or, or how to manage the city. What it needs to be is something more specific where you've got, say, the, the um, populations at risk on, you know, for the city area and then you've got some data points for a particular issue such as the urban heat island effect one. Uh, I had, still had a couple of more points. Okay, so how do we get there? I think two of the ways we get there is something that Tony Blank mentioned yesterday we, in his um, talk around uh, developer uh, engagement. And we need to be the, like he says about developer evangelists, if you're working in civic tech, you need to be the API. You need to be the one who is actually connecting the silos between city governments and the community groups and educating the community groups. So it was great seeing Cyril Vart yesterday talking about how anyone in business needs some coding skills and it's the same with we need to be able to go out to the community groups and choose one of those. They're also our user audience when we're doing user centric design. So they're of benefit to us and we can sort of we can um, support their understanding and the potential that's possible. Uh, I think also you see this sort of whole model is similar to what AT&T did internally across their whole enterprise in the US. When they, when they wanted to become an API enabled uh, API, API first enabled enterprise, they went to every specific department and spoke to the subject matter experts in those departments to try to figure out how to then introduce this sort of composable enterprise approach where everything was broken down into uh, uh, microservices almost that can be re reconstituted as needed. And that's the sort of smart cities approach I think that we can get to that's actually much more bottom up uh, and creates the sort of benefits so that we can avoid sort of a Blade Runner future. And here's two, two um, Parisian images for you as well. This is, does anyone know this? It's the museum. Yep, there we go. Great. So, yeah, it's a local museum. And then this is a street in Vavan or Rue Vavan or something where it's uh, got some... Um, plants coming out of the trees, so uh, plants coming out of the building. So that's the sort of uh, Babylon that I hope we can get to instead of Blade Runner. So thanks very much. So who has a, a question about smart cities? A few people, I talked to a few people that were working in smart cities during the conference. I don't know if they are still there. I have one question. <coughs> no, actually, it's really, it's really, uh, it's really, it's it's a real question. Um, you know, we have issues to make standards in the API space mainly. You know, so public transport, they have the GTFS, for example, for data. Actually, Google pushed it. It becomes okay. It's quite de facto standard. But on API side, we have issues to make standards. Each industry, like transport, like cities, like open data, how we could 
what will be the, the link? What will be the glue of it to your opinion? Is it, it, will it be politics? You know, we've seen that, for example, some cities have, uh, even with Paris, you know, there is Open Data Paris and Paris, uh, API.Paris.fr, which are different about politics. Right. What would be the glue to your mind? It's a tough question if you have the answer. Yep. Yeah. No, I look, I've, to me, I think the glue is, uh, is this civic engagement idea, this one here, uh, or the, the hackers and the community groups working together. Because there is actually already a uh, th third sector community infrastructure. But that, as far as being involved in what smart cities is capable of doing, or be, of, of them understanding the potential of open data, they're not on that, that page at all. They, don't, they haven't really been engaged with it all yet. Uh, and, but when they, they aren't uh, in that formal uh, infrastructure, organisational sort of infrastructure way. But I think there is a real community interest in that. We see that because of, you know, Yelp review, people putting up Yelp reviews or um, using Uber and all of those sorts of things. But we also see it, for example, when Guardian had a data supply around spending, they were able to mobilise and crowdsource uh, the community to be able to fill in all of the uh, out of that big data set to be able to structure it in a way that it was uh, be uh, able to be matched to each local parliamentary representative. So you could actually look at the spending for each of those representatives. And one thing I forgot to mention: it's the same with that Boyd Cohen um, map of the 30 of the 62. Um, of the 62 indicators, he sent that to 130 cities or something around the world and got 11 responses. But I don't know why either those cities or his project team wouldn't release it to those cities and try to activate the community members themselves or the city members themselves to help crowdsource the responses so the cities, so those citizens are more involved in identifying where they sit in this smart cities agenda sort of thing and because yeah so I mean like this that's sort of not really done I mean the citizen science crowdsourcing stuff would be a really great uh, that's the glue I think okay yeah. so who knows cut for America for example yeah you know you know well uh, maybe I can have your boss point of view on that but uh, uh, you know cut for America try to make this glue you know they often say that it's a kind of a civic movement <laughs> bottom-up civic movement uh, with the uh, developers and, and people involved in a s civic t and tech community. But, um, you know, they say we make a new kind of public service. It's one of their pitch. Um, but, you know, it, it takes time. It takes a lot of time and resources to make it. Yeah. So you, you think it will be sufficient? So then that's why I think the AT&T type model of if we can get to the composability of it all first. So it's more, it's about like cities seeing themselves as a platform and then turn, looking at things like open data as the building blocks and really making sure that that's all released so that then people can start doing that. And then it doesn't need... So I mean, there's still going to be stuff that needs the um, government, uh, the city's involvement that you would, and hopefully leadership, but the, their thinking around decision-making is often quite long and convoluted and startups or community groups can get in and solve it and get out uh, quickly and have ownership over it at a much faster cycle rate. So I think while governments try to steer towards it being a platform-oriented approach, then by enabling these building blocks, then it speeds up the, uh, you know, those sorts of solutions as well. The question? So my question was too good. It was not a McDonald's question. So thank you very much, Ma Mark. Thank you. Okay, thanks.